Right here. Estelle, thank you so much for joining us today and your willingness to be our first person and in, in fact coming all the way from Chicago to, to do this with us. So thank you very much. We have such a short period together so and you have you could talk to us for the next week and we would still feel we only got a glimpse of what you had to say, but we'll we'll get as much as we can in our hour. You were, you were 10 years old living in Warsaw when World War II began with Germany's invasion of Poland in September 1939. Before we turn to the war and to the Holocaust and all that you and your family went through, start first by just telling us some about you and your family in the years before the war. I was born in Warsaw, Poland to a middle-class family. War, though uh, there was, uh, there were outbursts of anti-Semitism in Poland before the war. Still war so close in my selective memory in golden radiance of lilac trees against open blue skies, rich sounds of good neighbors, kindness and trust and love. Magic train rides to the countryside in the summer all these memories, when I lost everything, became my possessions. Thank you, Estelle. When Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, starting the Second World War, um, they quickly attacked Warsaw, and Warsaw held out for a month. You wrote in your book that after the German army marched into Warsaw on October 1st, 1939, quote, immediately my life changed beyond imagination. Will you say more about that? Yes. Uh, immediately our lives changed beyond uh, imagination. My once peaceful streets were now patrolled by foreign soldiers. They snapped whips in our homes and streets. Um, they shouted insults and, and contempt. They isolated us in a tiny ghetto and build a thick wall around us. They filled the ghetto with people driven out from surrounding areas. Most came without a penny in their pockets, often without shoes on their feet. Most people died of cold and starvation. The ghetto was so, so tiny. 400,000 people were concentrated in just a few streets. Uh, people covered the bodies of their children with posters saying, children are the holiest things. Our children must live. Yet in this inferno, people found heroic ways to hold on to their humanity. Immediately, the Jewish community organized itself in far-reaching self-aid center, helping those who were the neediest amongst us. To own a book was an act of defiance, and many defied. My father had his stash of his favorite books, nights, windows blinded with covers to keep our existence secret in a small room uh, illuminated by a carbide light. We had no electricity, was cut off. My father would pull out his books by his favorite Yiddish authors, by Sholem Aleichem and Sholem Ash and Isaac Peretz, and he read to us bringing to life remote worlds. Um, guns hovering over our heads did not stop us to uh, celebrate holidays. We pulled the window shades down and that was enough. To own a book, uh, 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 to, we even had theaters. Imagine theaters when there was no bread. There was a wonderful writer in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was a historian, and his name was Chaim Kaplan. And he said that it is incredible that when we don't seem 
to need it at all. We need poetry more than we need bread. And I think that this is right. I think that our ability to think for ourselves and not follow like blind hordes, our ability to create, to express ourselves is our godliness. And all over the ghetto, in cold rooms, teachers met, unemployed, heroic teachers, met with children in cold rooms and taught them to hold on to their imaginations and trust in love. Still, will you tell us in light of that about the teachers, will you tell us just a little bit about Pani Mauricia, if I'm saying the name right, who was a teacher of yours? Oh, Pani Mauricia. Well, um, we, down the street from where we lived, behind a fence, behind a um, bushes, there was a little house uh, where Pani Marisha uh, um, the, the had a room, a secret room, where we would walk into, uh, there were like eight of us, and, uh, and she, there were no uh, teacher aides materials, uh, and she created a world for us of imagination, of trust, of, of, as a matter of fact, when I later became a teacher, she was my role model because she used the children's language and the children's experiences, which is really the most, most, the closest uh, in teaching language arts and teaching. Um, she made us aware of the sky of each other and uh, uh, the world became, became so alive. And uh, so yes, she was my role model. Your role model. Yes. In, in the midst of all that you've just described, how, how did your family manage to make ends meet, to eat, to, to even though um, if food was very scarce. How, how did you there manage to There was absolutely such starvation. I believe that we were allowed something like 181 uh, calories uh, per day, which apparently is less than 10% of the minimum required yes. uh, calorie intake. But you know, the resourcefulness of human being is very admirable and very inspiring. And there was a, um, a vigorous underground market, black market, and little children would, uh, um, we move bricks uh, on, uh, at the bottom of the, of the wall, and like little mice, children no older than six and eight years old would crawl under the wall and smuggle in potatoes and onions. If they survived, the family ate. Uh, and in addition to that, um, the wall around us had gates that were guarded very strictly. But the Nazi soldiers lined their pockets with bribery, uh, and there were big time smugglers, and then the gates would open and some food came in. But there, was no, there were no stores, uh, uh, only the stores that sold the ration uh, food that we got. So there were no stores, but there were places, secret rooms where, but most of the people could not afford because nobody worked. So most people starved. Mm -hmm. It was just a few people. Mm -hmm. uh, we were fortunate. My father was a jeweler, and during the war, gold becomes the most stable currency. So we did not starve in the ghetto, but was littered with, with, with uh, 
people who had yeah. corpses. Yes. The Nazis began deporting Jews out of Auschwitz, out of the ghetto, in large numbers in 1942, to sending them to death camps and concentration camps. For a period of time, your parents managed to keep you from being deported, to keep you safe. How did they manage was, to do that? It was not really safe. Okay, so in uh, July 1942, the month of my 13th birthday, mm -hmm. things became even more gruesome. This was the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, excuse me, deportations. We had no inkling that the deportations meant death. So many people marched voluntarily and unknowingly to death, but many people hid. We lived in apartment buildings. Where does one hide in an apartment building? And many people had tried to hide. Pretty much in the same places that children play hide and go seek. We hid behind beds, we hid behind chairs, we hid between mattresses and box springs, in cupboards and drawers, anywhere where we could disappear. Some people would pull a wardrobe uh, in front of a door to uh, obscure the door and hide in a secret room. We hid in a secret room. We, uh, everybody in the row of the same apartments covered the same room, ho hoping that this would uh, keep us our secret place uh, less obvious. Uh, from July 1942 till September 1942, not even in, in a full two months, 99% of the children disappeared. The deportations took place with 20th century know-how and Stone Age values. Uh, in these two months, 99% of the children disappeared. I was among the 1% of children still alive. Can you imagine a world without the sound of children, without the presence of grandparents, grandmothers, and grandfathers, because old people and children were the first to be deported. We never hear, heard from the people who were deported, but a few managed to come back under the cover of night, and they told us about the horrendous train rides to a place called Treblinka, where our people were guests. I cannot imagine how anyone who loves the wives and the children and the mothers and the friends could do such a horrendous thing. This is why I am sharing this very difficult story. And I think that this is why you are here, to be reminded that human beings are capable of tremendous evil. And in that recognition, appreciate and support so much more the value of love. We are all one family. If one person in the family suffers, everyone suffers. And that was the... the if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you one, have you tell one more thing about um, what you said about the fact that you were part of the remaining 1% of children. At some point, the Nazis declared that any child under the age of 14 was useless, which hastened the deportation of the kids. You were 13. What did your mother do? Yeah, well, I was a complete persona non grata. I was forbidden to live. And so my mother, I had uh, uh, braids, and so my mother cut my hair, my hair up, dressed me up to look older. And I was very frightened, and I asked my father, what would he do? What would happen if they found out 
that um, I was only 13, not 14, and my father said, I will burn their eyes out with acid. I won't let them touch you. I believed him that I was safe, if only in his love. And still, you were, you were still in the ghetto when the remarkable Warsaw Uprising and the subsequent horrific obliteration of the Warsaw Ghetto took place. Tell us about the Warsaw Uprising and what, what happened to you and your family. As soon as the people learned about Treblinka, there was no, made no sense to wait and hope that uh, we will hold on to our lives and the lives of our children uh, if we waited until the war was over. At that point, the people began to organize themselves into armed resistance. But there was only a handful of people left. The ghetto was so, the buildings were so empty. There was such silence. I remember I would sometimes walk out of the building and walk across the courtyard to the gate and open the gate and hope to hear a sound of life. But the silence was so palpable, it was crawling at me. And um, I lost track of what... About the, about the Warsaw right. Uprising. So, um, so at that point, this handful of, um, of uh, remaining uh, Jewish people began to organize themselves and to armed resistance. My father was a member. Mm -hmm. And they began to build a bankers uh, uh, in, in, in under the basement, uh, in, under the, in the basements. My family moved from the second floor apartment to uh, the basement and we to build a, uh, um, a, a, a bunker under the, actually I am, was the ground floor and the, and the bunker was in the basement. Um, and, um, the freedom fight, the fighters also, uh, they build a network of bankers for, for entrenchment and for, uh, and, um, for what, uh, and, and they also dug tunnels, a network of tunnels between the bankers for navigation. And they also dug a tunnel underneath the wall in order to get to the Christian side and hopefully get arms from the Christian on the ground. Um, events erupted with columns of Nazi soldiers entering the ghetto and uh, with, with, with uh, armored tank cars, um, with flocks of bomber planes above us. We had, we had a secret trap door to our bunker, which was the powder room floor and the commode and all. We lifted the trap door and walked down the flimsy uh, ladder into the bank bunker pulled the trap door down. The walls closed in on me. The damp ceiling pressed down on me. The flickering of the carbide light was our only substitute for the sun. The ticking of the clock was our only clue when morning was rising and sun was setting. How, how, I miss the open blue horizon. Uh, and while we were in the bunker, uh, fighting broke out in the streets, facing a 20th century army, armed from head to toe, facing armored cars and tanks and flocks of, of bomber planes, was a handful of freedom fighters, poorly clad, poorly armed, poor 
slowly fed, they climbed up on rooftops in front of open windows, it crawled out of the bunkers and the, uh, and the secret tunnels and stepped in front of tanks and lobbed Molotov cocktails and whatever arms they had. You know it is noteworthy that it took that handful of fighters longer to fight than it took for friends or for Poland to capitulate. As you described, this poorly armed, um, poorly um, clad uh, uh, group of resistance fighters held off the might of the German army for a month, but of course, eventually they began to t destroy building by building, and they got to your building. What, what, how did they discover you? At some point, a grenade was thrown into our bunker and there was not a corner to hide anymore. They pulled us out into the streets. Um, the b b uh, bombs, <laughs> the, the, street, the streets were littered in people in lying in congealed blood. Uh, flames, enormous tongues of flames were licking the sky and painting it in otherworldly colors of iridescence, bombs flying all around us, smoke, and they marched us to Umschlagplatz, the deportation uh, stop, and loaded us onto freight trains, and we ended up in Maidanek extermination camp, where the electrified barbed wire fence marked the end of our horizon where the crematorium was clear in sight. And if that was not enough for sadism, they had a gallow in the uh, middle of the assembly field where innocent people were dangling from gibbets. And my father was gassed there. Your father was gassed there. And right. th did that happen almost immediately when the four of you got there? Yes. So what, what happened then to your mother and your sister and you? So it's just the three of you. Well, we did this awful um, slave labor. We dug, we were made to <laughs> dig turf. It was completely useless. Actually, we were housed in the barracks. It was sort of a storage place. Mm -hmm. And we, that we, were, we were condemned for the guest chambers. And um, a random luck, coincidentally, my sister was beaten by a, uh, by a woman, um, a guard. Nazi guard, very badly. And so the following day, she was not able to move, she was so beaten. She was such a beautiful, gentle, a 14 year old. And uh, so we hid her under the bunk beds when we went to work and she was put on a list. Our assumption was that anyone who was put on the list was designated for the guest chamber. The three of us had a pact that if one of us would be sent to the guest chamber, all three of us would go. Mm -hmm. So the logical thing for my mother and me to do was to trade places with two other women who were on the list and who hoped to see another sunrise. So the following day, when the names were called, uh, my mother and sister and I marched absolutely sure that we were going, we were marched to the uh, guest chambers, but as it turned out, they loaded us onto a freight train and we ended up in a, uh, in a slave labor camp in Skarżysko. Uh, there was a slight distinction between slave labor camps and uh, and uh, extermination camp. Maidan, the extermination camp, was a killing factory place. Uh, Skarżysko, we worked in an ammunition factory. Estelle, if I could, before you go on about, about um, what it was like there, I want a couple more questions about Maidanik, but in 
particular, you, you, of course, you lost your father. If you don't mind, you had a photograph of your father. Will you, yes. will you share that with us, how you lost your photograph? Right. So everything was taken away from us, but I managed to save a photograph of my father, and I hid it under the lining of the shoe. I, as I was marching to the showers, we were sure that the showers that we were marching to, where we knew about the showers that were uh, guests, that, and so we were pretty sure that that was the end. As a matter of fact, when the water was spurting at us, it was chlorinated water. So it had such a strong guess. I was sure that that was the end, but it wasn't. But anyway, so I had that picture of my father hidden uh, in my, the lining of my shoe. And a Nazi soldier stopped me. And he said, you have something hidden. If you want to live, you better give it to me. I said, I have nothing. I, I have nothing. And he said, I know you have something. So I thought uh, I might as well be truthful. And I, I thought the picture would be so meaningless to him. So I retrieved the photo and I said, that's all I have is the photo of my father. Well, he snapped it away from me and that was gone. That was that gone. Was gone. Right. I, I know we can't spend much more time on, on, on it, any particular part of what you're sharing with us, but you, you've written about in your book things that are just, I, I want to mention a couple if I can. The work that you, you mentioned, meaningless work, it was to dig up the turf, just dig up patches of turf, um, and then others would be replant that same part that was dug up just over and over and over again. And then Estelle also shared that in the bitter cold, they kept themselves warm, she, her mom and her sister, by literally blowing on each other, blowing warm air. Well, yes, if you breathe out, if you put your uh, mouth against at someone's back, I sometimes do it to my grandchildren <laughs> when they are very cold, uh, uh, and you breathe out, you get a gust of very warm air. Mm. So this is how we kept ourselves. So as you began to tell us, they took you to Scarsisca. Right. Um, Scarsisco, and, and that, it was different in terms of the work you did. Right. But tell us a little more about your time in Scarsisco. Well, it, 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 it was the, <laughs> it, it, the slave labor camp too was enclosed by an electrified barbed wire fence. Every few feet there were uh, towers with sentries. And, and beams of light, and uh, um, we worked from from uh, from sunrise to sunset. Uh, our isolation was so, and it was also true in the next camp in in Chemstochowa. Our isolation was so so unimaginably dark and thick. I remember when we used to, to work, to walk from work uh, in the morning to work and from, and from work. The only, the only contact with, we had with life was a patch of sky. Um, this patch of sky was our only connection with life, with freedom. And, and also, and on some, I think on a, on a subliminal level, on, on a subconscious level, it, it, was, it was an affirmation that under, in the eye of the universe, in the eye of God, we are all one. And that was reassuring. If that, and there was another thing. Um, uh, also, the, 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 the fact that um, your mind, in a way, is always free. Uh, even, even, if it, even if it means what you'll be thinking of, 
uh, when, when, when we were facing death. Even in Majdanek and any of these camps, in this utter isolation, where the only contact was with life, was that patch of sky that we only saw a glimmer of. Um, and also the ability to think how we are going to face that, even in Majdanek and even in the other camps. Uh, we conjured up memories of, of, uh, of uh, the, 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 just the glory of seeing a, a new rising sun, uh, the sanctity of simple moments with family and people that you love. You see, we endured because we held on to to our memories, we held on to our love because we experienced it before, which really also points out the fact that it takes a village to, uh, to, to teach people that love exists and uh, that was nurturing. May I ask you a few more questions, if sure. you can, Estelle? Um, it, you had considered for a title for your book before it became Transcending Darkness, The Three Monkeys. And I think that name came from your time at Scar Cisco. Right. Will, will you tell us how that came about? Okay, so we, my mother was the only mother in, the, in all the three camps that I am aware of. And that that I, had children with her. And yeah. right, right, that had children, yeah. right. And uh, in Majdanek, for instance, we were the only family of three people that I am aware of. Most everyone else was alone. So we were covered with uh, lice and mange because the, we had no soap. I don't even believe that we had towels. We had some running water and very little time to wash. So we were so filthy, covered with mange and scabs, and scabs get uh, um, um, the skin lice itch, mm -hmm. and you, you scratch, and your skin gets infected, and we had no uh, no medication, so we would pick lice like monkeys, and because um, we were the only family of three, uh, our um, fellow, um, uh, our sister concentration camp uh, inmates called us the three monkeys affectionately. Because the, the, uh, uh, the, in Majdanek, women and men were se uh, segregated and children just did not exist. At all, except for the two of you. Right. S th thanks for telling us that. Uh, still, from there, of course, you went to yet another camp in the summer of 1944, Shustatova. Well, Częstochowa was another camp in Poland, and it was also, a, we worked in a German uh, um, ammunition factory. And, and you would be liberated from there. And then we, yes. So that was from, nine, that was in January 1945. So that was from 1939. Till, nine, till January 1945, um, suddenly a miracle. We hear a rumble of planes and we ask ourselves, could it be? And uh, we were liberated uh, this, the following morning. But I assure you that liberation was not anything like you are likely to imagine. All we, uh, it was winter, the ground was covered with snow and ice. Poland is quite cold. And uh, all we had on was a loose calf and no underwear, uh, no, no stockings, wooden clogs. And uh, we shuffled out. The camp was enclosed with like a no man's land. And we shuffled out. And, we are so afraid, is it a ruse? And we hear Russian uh, soldiers, so we rush to them. 
like we see Messiah and the soldiers hold, held up their hands and they said, uh, we still have a war to fight and they did because the war was not over till May of 1945. So from 1945 to 1947, we were wandering uh, through uh, Poland, through Czechoslovakia, and to Germany, and I'll explain in a minute why we were heading for Germany. We didn't have a penny in our pockets. We had no home to come back to. We had, uh, we had no, no, no country to go back to. Uh, there was still a lot of anti-Semitism and hostility uh, in Poland, although not everyone. There were also many, many very kind people, but there were enough uh, people who showed a lot of hostility that we felt that we were a country less and we eventually came to this wonderful country, the United States. When, be before we turn to a little bit more about that, when you first were liberated, d tell us what kind of condition that you and Fredka and your mother were in and how you did manage to get some food because uh, you, you had been in starved conditions. Well, uh, w we were really pretty much, uh, we, we were begging, yeah. and we were fortunate that we were actually, what we did, we were wandering, we were hopping trains, uh, going, looking for family. At one point, and I describe it in my book, at some point, uh, we, um, uh, uh, three, uh, two uh, Russian soldiers gave us shelter. Uh, and um, it, it, it was, it's amazing how much suffering a human being can endure and remain human. You know, we survived uh, with love for humanity, with uh, compassion, and with joy of life. Life should be lived joyfully. Uh, I think it is important to remember that suffering does not have to drive you to anger and despair, that it can teach you to be more, uh, to love more deeply and to be compassionate. Do you, can you say a little bit more? You've already said, uh, uh, told us, you know, uh, I think what it took for you to endure. If you want to say just a little bit more about how the three of you got through all of that. It, it's, I mean, what you've described is horrific, but when you read your book and go into so much more details, you know, for most of it, it's, it's beyond our imagination. How, how do you think you managed to survive through all that? I, to endure, you had to hold on to, to your memories. Mm -hmm. You held on to, to the love that you knew, and it was, you know, uh, um, uh, it, it was symbols like like the the, the patch of sky uh, that reminded you of, of that humanity is one, uh, and uh, uh, it was memories of love at home that you got. And my mother told us in front of the crematorium. She said. Uh, the world has a conscience, and we thought she was out of her mind in front of the crematorium. And she said, you'll see, if we'll survive, you'll see that the Nazis' children and their children's children for generations will be asking how it could have happened. How could it have happened in a country, a highly literate country? And you know what? My mother was right. Uh, the people in Germany are asking, how could it have happened? I am so grateful for that because I feel that understanding is a responsibility. I think that redemption comes with understanding because unless you understand, 
you will not advance. And I think that we are all left with the legacy to understand that human beings are capable of nobility and, and, and cruelty. One, one more question for you, Stel, before we, I think we have time to turn to our audience for a few questions. I, if you'd I'm like looking that. forward well, to well, that. Just one more much. for you from me. Um, you've mentioned the importance of the, the, the patch of blue sky that you could yes. see. Well, we, we have a, muse, a new exhibit in the museum, yes. um, which is called 1,078 Blue Skies. Tell us about the significance of that for you. Oh, uh, that exhibit touches me very deeply. Um, and it's a very interesting exhibit. There are um, 1,078 um, photos uh, of skies uh, in the various concentration camps. From 1,078 camps. 78. Yeah. Uh, it touches me because of, of the affirmation of life that I felt when I looked at the sky. And, uh, and when you look at the individual um, photos of the skies, in a way you are reminded that we are all individuals, yet we are all united. We are all one in the eye of the divine, in the eye of, of, of the universe. And, uh, and so I think that um, that is, um, the, uh, uh, and, 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 and really that unity is love, and that is uh, the healing uh, uh, thing. Um, th th that is what will keep the, the civilization uh, advancing. And I, I hope you get a chance to, it's, you know, it's, it's very simple. I hope you get a chance to, to, to see it. So we, we have time for a few questions from our audience. We have um, two microphones, one in each aisle. We do ask that you go to the microphone to ask your question. Please try to make the question as brief as you can, um, and I will repeat it just to be sure that we hear it right so that it still can respond to it. So um, hopefully somebody has a question, but if not, I probably will uh, ask many, many more, but I'm gonna uh, hold off. Here we go. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, okay my question was when you were in the, in the different camps, you always had Nazi guards. Um, were, they, were there any times where you saw where the Nazi guards were actually felt sorry or felt bad for what they were doing? Or, and they just, they were doing it because they had to? Or were, were they all pretty much just evil people? Question is, in, in the various camps that you were in, did you see any inc incidents where uh, the soldiers, the guards, the Nazi guards were um, maybe felt uh, sorry for you or felt bad as opposed to just being completely evil. Were there any, any examples of that in your mind? I have not seen any soldiers who uh, had the courage to show kindness but I absolutely believe that there was goodness in them. I absolutely, you know, they had faces like my faces. Um, they, they, um, I, I have to see my humanity in their humanity. I have to believe that there was some goodness in them. And, um, and that is my hope. Well, while we're waiting to see if anybody else has a question, um, I have to take advantage of and ask oh. another one if I can. I want you to go back. Uh, this is, I believe, when you were on your way to, uh, I believe, Scarzisco. You were on the train, and the train stopped, and that incident ended up possibly saving your life. It had to do with it, where the train was going, and there was a Will you, will you share that? Yeah, well, that, uh, the randomness of, of luck. Mm -hmm. um, um, those who survived um, were not any braver or any, any more clever than the others. 
um, but a lot of it depended on randomness, and the ra and this random situation was that the train stopped for a pit stop, and uh, my we left the train, and uh, and then when we came back to get on the train, we walked into a different car, and that car ended up to uh, uh, in in a place in Skarżysko that was less, less perilous. Okay. It's just a, you got on the wrong, you got in the wrong right. car. Yep. Okay. We have a question here. Yes. Hi. Um, so you said that when you were moving, um, you were moving out of Poland and through Czechoslovakia and into Germany, and it looks like you moved from Germany to the U.S., so kind of why did you take the path that you took and why were you heading to Germany? So the question is um, when, when, you, when you were liberated and you, as you said, you you, you went many places, but headed towards Czechoslovakia, then Germany. Why did you go oh, to right. Germany? Why did we? Yes, I forgot to mention yeah. the reason for it. We went to Germany because uh, um, the Germ the sec sec Germany was um, the, the American forces were in Germany, and we our dream was to come to the United States to a country that does not define uh, the citizenship of, of a person by religion. Uh, while we were, I, war, Poland was my country, it was my world, but I was Jewish, so I was, I was not defined, although this was my only world that I knew. In this country, well, this was our hope to come here. My mother had here a, a two sisters and a brother, so eventually we established contact and we came here and I see another. We do, we have another one right here. Hi Estelle. Um, I was wondering, you speak about healing. Are you able to forgive for Question. what happened to you? The question is, are you able to forgive? Are you able to forgive able in your healing? To forgive. I have a very hard time understanding fully the meaning of forgiveness. If forgiveness means not to carry bitterness, not to hate, I feel hate has to stop somewhere. An eye for an eye and we'll all be blind. I believe that the only way to deal with hate is love. Um, so I, but I do, I do feel, I, I'm not sure I can forgive, who am I to forgive for the other people? I'm not sure I can forgive for the loss of childhood that I suffered, but I carry no bitterness. I, 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 I carry sadness about it. But, uh, so that's, that's how, this is my response. Thank you. Oh, thank you. If, 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 with your blessing. I see another Okay. <laughs> she wants the questions. <laughs> Please. Yeah, thank you for sharing your top story. Uh, I'm from South Korea. So uh, this is second visit to me here. So my question is, actually I'm working as a teacher uh, in the elementary level. So I have a question about um, what's the uh, most essential lesson to your students when you uh, were a teacher, when uh, related to your um, experience which you taught us today? What was the essential lesson to your students? What was the if, if I'm understanding correctly, you're a teacher from South Korea or teaching in South Korea now? Um, there. Yeah. Question is, as a teacher, what was the essential lesson that you, drawing on your experience, that you, you felt you were teaching? Is that a fair way of yes. putting it? Yes. Um, uh, I, I think the experience was the, uh, the dignity and the worth of each individual, the humanity mm -hmm. in us the faith in the creative abilities that we have uh, and um, uh, using the children's language to teach language arts. 
um, talking, st uh, um, stimulating, asking questions, uh, hearing, hearing children share um, their experiences and their feelings, mm -hmm. and the humanity in us, the creativity in us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna turn back to Estelle in just a moment to close our program. Um, before I do, I wanna do a couple of things. One is I wanna share with you, if I can, um, something that Estelle has written in her book, because um, I think this is just an amazing statement. Quote, our survival depended 99% on random luck and 1% on instinct and grit. Without the 1% pluck, you were 100% dead. I think it's just a powerful, powerful statement. Thank you for being with us. We have two more programs left. Next Wednesday and Thursday, we end our 2019 year of first person. We'll resume again next March, 2020. All of our programs are available on the museum's YouTube page, so Estelle's will be posted within the next couple of weeks, but you can also see our other programs. So if you don't have the chance to come back, we hope that you can join us um, electronically. Um, it's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. And so I'm gonna turn back to Estelle to close it. I'm gonna have to ask you to hold on the question now if that's okay. And, and, and one more other comment, when Estelle finishes, our photographer Joel is going to come up on the stage and he's going to take a photograph of Estelle with you as the audience, as the background. So please stay with us for that as well. So Estelle, I'd like to turn back to you to close our program. Um, I thank you so very much all for being here. It is so difficult to talk about the subject because it generates such pain and it's so difficult to listen to it. Yet we have to be reminded from time to time of the consequences to us and to humanity when we accommodate ourselves to tyrants, how it corrupts the conscience of a nation, what it does to love and trust. It is noteworthy that it took Hitler a mere 14 years to turn the Weimar uh, re, uh, democracy into a police state. I am, as long as there are people who are saying that the Holocaust never happened, and as long as genocides are still happening today, in some way, um, the uh, Holocaust is still with us. I uh, am so grateful for the existence of this museum uh, and for keeping the memory alive so that we don't let it happen again. And I so much appreciate your being here and for caring. And thank you so very much.